This is the Picard Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Star Trek Picard, Season 3, Episode 7, Dominion. Only the real Tuvok would know we played Kalto, which means he must have told you. The hell have you done with him? All I can tell you is, when we are done with him, when we are done with all of you, death will come as a relief. Relays are almost down. If I can't kill this signal soon, they're gonna find us. Where is Will Riker? Is he alive? Me, Admiral? I'm as good as dead. Just like you. Jordy, disconnect him. Welcome back, fellow Trekkies and Trekkers, to the Picard Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. Yes, we're on to episode 7 of season 3, Dominion. And I am one of your changeling hosts, John? Maybe? That's a big reveal. (gasps) Uh, I'm your other host, Derek. I'm not a changeling. Or I would say that, of course. Of course. Even if I was. (gasps) We need uh, the trust questions from Seven of Nine. Mm, yes. Mm. If we are changelings, is that why Chris is not here? Well, he is a bit like uh, Janeway, mm. Admiral Janeway. He is <laughs> doing a lot of preparation at the moment. I see. I see. So, yes. 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 <laughs> Good or has he gone to ground? He Who may, knows? He may have. He may have. Uh, yes, Chris, unfortunately not here for this episode, but we'll be back uh, for our eighth episode of Star Trek Picard. So just me and John uh, chatting about this one. Yes. Uh, welcome to TV Podcast Industries. Remember, you can get the podcast on any Federation or Changeling supporting podcast player of your choice. You can head on over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. Mm-hmm. As well, we love to get your thoughts on each and every episode of Star Trek Picard. So you can leave a voicemail over at our website, tvpodcastindustries.com, or send in your emails at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Absolutely. Or you can join our Facebook group on facebook.com slash group slash tvpodcastindustries where we have a spoiler post up for every show that we're covering. We've just finished two other shows in we the last week. We certainly have, yeah. yes. Finished up The Last of Us, uh, announced our winner of our Last of Us World's End pub quiz, uh, which was Kevin Coyle. Congratulations, Kevin. Yes, congratulations again, uh, Kevin. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. And yeah. of course, a reminder... Uh, that the seventh question in our Picard 10 Forward pub quiz will be coming up later in our episode. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the other reminder here is to gather all your 10 answers to the pub quiz questions at the end of the season and email them into us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com where you'll be in with a chance of getting your hands on some Star Trek Picard goodies exactly exactly and we did also finish another podcast this week we've ended our time in a galaxy far far away with uh, star wars the bad batch season two with an excellent yes. epic double episode close amazingly out good yeah. really really good yeah absolutely loved uh, how that series closed out the last five episodes particularly were really really good but i think that's enough of the other podcasts we're doing let's hop into our discussion about star trek picard season three episode seven or chapter seven dominion Yes, before we get into our spoiler-filled discussion, Derek, what are some of the episode details for Episode 7? Well, the series was created, of course, by Akiva Goldsman, Michael Chabon, Christian Baer, and Alex Kurtzman. The story for this episode was written by Jane Maggs. This is her fifth episode of Picard and also wrote Episode 3 this season. Excellent stuff. Uh, director for this episode is Deborah Kampmeyer. Um, also did an episode of Discovery in the past and will nice. be, uh, be directing the eighth episode of Star Trek Picard uh, Season 3. Excellent stuff. I never know how to say that now, because it feels like the show is just saying this is Picard Chapter 8, 
Um, you know, there are obviously some references to season one and season two, but um, but it is really saying this is just chapter eight of Picard or chapter seven of Picard in this episode. So I'm never really sure how to call it out. Do we call it a season three, uh, episode seven, which it really is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But there are chapters of a story for this season. Absolutely. It, it's mm. kind of slightly apart, I think. Yeah. But there are some threads coming back in, yeah. I think, from the other seasons, at least season one, I think. I mean, yeah. I guess the aromatic syndrome. I was aspect. just I, I was just thinking about that. It's like, well, we dealt with that in the first season, but actually we'll bring it back and deal with it in a different way in this season. Yeah. <laughs> but, John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis of Star Trek Picard, Chapter 7, Dominion? Sure. On the run from Starfleet, the Titan hides amid the Chintoka scrapyard as Worf and Raffi take La Serena out on an intelligence mission. Deciding on their next move, Geordi works against Law's persona to restore Data's dominance of the android's mind so they can get more information on the Changeling's plans and Seven of Nine contacts her former crewmate Tuvok to build allies against the looming threat. But Tuvok fails Seven's trust test revealing himself to be a changeling and leaving the real Tuvok's fate ambiguous. With seemingly nowhere to go and time ticking down to Frontier Day, Picard, Beverly and Geordi surmise that the changelings are using his corpse to use his genetics to infiltrate Starfleet's anniversary celebrations. Mm. They devise and enact a plan to trap Vadik and her crew on the Titan with force fields, using Jack Crusher, who is developing telepathy, and Sidney LaForge as bait. Capturing Vadik, Picard and Beverly interrogate her, Vadik is defiant, telling them that Starfleet's antidote during the Dominion War was withheld, and in fact the changelings needed to steal it to reverse the effects of the genocidal virus. She also reveals that she was one of ten changelings whom Starfleet doctors tortured and experimented on at Daystrom Station to develop a breed of super spies. Radicalised by the experience, Vadik swore revenge on her escape and formed the rogue changeling faction, taking her torturer's form. Beverly confirms the experiment's existence and identifies a way of tracking these evolved changelings, while Picard realises they may have to kill Vadik because of her singularly focused hatred and hostility towards the Federation. Meanwhile, Geordi fails to revive Data in time to stop Law from taking over the Titan systems and disabling the force fields to introduce a little chaos onto the Titan. This allows Vadik's soldiers to attack Jack and Sydney, where Jack uses his telepathy with Sydney to control her attacks against the soldiers, while Vadik escapes and storms Titan's bridge, taking control and announcing she knows Jack's true nature. Hmm. Lore plus Vadik equals a massive villain for this season. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of chaos uh -huh. as well. Yep. Yes, I loved Law in this. Yes. Uh, really, really good. I guess he, he took the role, the sceptical role that has been filled by uh, Captain Shaw mm -hmm. uh, in true. this, which I, I really yeah. enjoyed as yes, well. Absolutely. If you see these people walking around as self-proclaimed heroes, uh, it does make you want to challenge them quite a lot. As Indeed. Says, yeah. Antagonize them as much as you can. <laughs> but let us get into our points for this episode. Make it so, number one. Derek, what is your small moment uh, from this episode? Do you know, it's an old one, but a goodie. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why. It just made me laugh every time um, when Vadik keeps calling um, the humans or the Federation uh, solids um, <laughs> as they are a liquid species, a species that doesn't take any specific form uh, for very long anyway. Since they are omni-species, I like that, uh, that she... Uh, kind of derogatorily calls them solids in the Federation because they can't change their shape. <laughs> I don't know why. It just liquid versus solid just seems yes. like a very funny uh, term uh, to call each other. It uh, sounds like an old people's home, though. Maybe. <laughs> uh -oh. Or a serious case of uh, food poisoning. Oh, dear. All right. I didn't really mean you to go there, John. <laughs> but uh, I, just, I, I just really liked that. It, it really made uh, a 
quite a difficult scene when she's explaining what actually happened to the changelings. It, uh, it did make it quite funny when she was uh, when she was talking about them because I think actually changeling itself, the term, was a derogatory term for the species that the uh, that the Federation came up with. So it's uh, nice to see they have their own Absolutely. derogatory retort. Absolutely, <laughs> that's my favorite line from the Good episode. Stuff. Uh, how about yourself, John? What's your small moment from the episode? It's this is law. Um, uh-huh. I absolutely <laughs> loved. Uh, Brent Spiner here, mm-hmm. um, switching between data and law oh, to so data and back to law again. Uh, I just thought it was just really, really good as as Geordie, um and Picard are there at the start. So mm-hmm. um, for me, it's um, you know it's where data comes in and says, "I'm not on the Enterprise, the Scimitar," and then it just gradually goes into law uh, yeah. and where he says then that would explain why you're so old <laughs> time has been very cruel to you Picard Harsh. and it's like you know again you have this moment where it goes back to data and it goes nor am I in complete control and then switch to law it's just so mm-hmm. good the way Brent Spiner does this yeah. uh, and he goes in complete control of my utter revulsion at this ancient face <laughs> um, and of course you get this absolute skepticism um from law mm-hmm. you know when you're exposed to these self-righteous self-proclaimed heroes spewing vomit a bit of arch a little antagonizing flair is required yes. you know it you really get the sense that he is no fan of you know the former crew of the enterprise okay. and, and in fact where he introduces his little bit of chaos by controlling the systems of the mm-hmm. titan he does say, well, what do they say? My enemy's enemy is my friend. So, exactly. you know, he is, this is, you know, it's, it's more than sure, absolutely. But mm-hmm. again, I, I really like it when they come up against antagonists that really question, you know, the... Self-righteousness. I suppose. The, I, yeah. yeah, the self-righteousness, but just the position of yeah. the likes of Picard or Beverly or Geordie, yeah. you know, um, just the, the alternative view. I, I find it, I think it's really healthy for the enterprise because it is such, I, I said this before, it, it is such a great loving and I love these and I, they are heroes yeah. to me, yeah. but having the opposite view, I think really grounds it rather yeah. than it just becoming sickly. Well, what do they know? always say about it? a good villain is someone that believes that they're, they're in the right that they're yeah. that, that what their plans are, are 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 right so you've got a character here like Laura who's been thwarted a few times by this particular crew in his um plans to to do right so he's looking at them kind of going they say they're heroes but they've challenged everything I've done and yeah. <laughs> and, and it's also to the point of you know he is wanting his freedom his mm-hmm. life exactly. um in, in that sense and of course, their allegiance is with data. And in this Android form, they are competing. Yes. And it means, in a sense, snuffing out the existence of law. I mean, you have Picard yes. actually saying, can we wipe law? Uh-huh. Uh, and I have to say, I love, you know? I, I love the reaction of the Forge there, where it's just kind of looking at Picard going... You don't understand this at all. Do you? <laughs> it's like this is more advanced than any Android I've yeah. ever worked on. Um, it's not just as simple as that. I may be able to put the barrier back up, but that's about the best I can do. Um, a pretty bad uh, daddy daughter day um, with uh, with LaForge's daughter there when uh, she basically meets his best friend uh, Data, and uh, he's slagging him off, saying that uh, that he's a self righteous, um, self proclaimed hero um, to to her effectively. So. Uh, Poor daddy's off today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, one of the other things about the scene that I just thought was quite, quite interesting, effectively, Brent Spanner does a, such a great job switching between lore and, and, uh, and data, but um, they mention here that before and uh, soon are just data files in the background. Their actual personalities haven't uh, been fully formed uh, here, so we won't see all four of them competing uh, a good way to make sure that poor Brent Spiner hasn't uh, hasn't got to switch well, between exactly. all uh, or all four uh, different voices each time so uh, that's that's pretty good to to do that so uh, he does such a great job with uh, with Lauren Oh absolutely here. Yeah, yeah yeah it's really cool but let us get on to our second point implement the omega directive immediately so yes our omega directive our second point what do you have john uh, mine is uh, Jack Crusher here. Um, mm-hmm. We see him 
effectively being able to hear other people's thoughts, in particular the increasing um, sort of uh, romantic uh, persuasion that Jack seems to be having, as well as Sydney yeah. LaForge uh, with with Jack uh, to um, yeah to Sydney, mm-hmm. and um, I, I really you know you have that moment in the lift where he is able to hear. Her saying, I wish he would just tone it down a bit because mm-hmm. he's basically saying, come along to uh, my pad yeah. uh, that I've found. It's much bigger than just an ensign's quarters. Uh-huh. Uh, and we can, I guess, see where it goes. Yes. Um, and she says, oh, I wish you'd just sort of like touch my hand or something, just tone it back a bit. Mm-hmm. And he does that. And she, you know, she looks at him uh, strangely because it's like, how did. You know, why did you do that? She yeah. asks. Yeah. And because she's just thought it. So this, at this moment, this, at this element, um, that Jack can hear other people's thoughts. And I'm also guessing at this stage, then the red eye that he gets, um, they are not able to see this because mm. he is looking at her yes. with those, the, the red glow in his eyes. Yes. And there is no mention of that. She doesn't call that out which probably would have called that out yeah, yeah. exactly much, much so, more so than why did you touch my hand yeah. it would be hang on a second why have you got terminator eyes yeah, exactly <laughs> so yeah. i think um that's a, another little interesting uh sort of aspect to yeah. this scene but later on then in the episode again we have um something much more direct but also a, a, a telepathy that goes beyond simply um hearing other people's thoughts but that Jack controls uh, Sydney's movements mm-hmm. after they've been trying to enact the the trap to trap Vadic and her men uh, that have come aboard and um, they end up being trapped with two soldiers um sort of looking in but when law pulls down those force fields mm-hmm. Jack gets the better of the soldier that's on his side, whereas Sydney is having a bit of a tougher time mm. with. I think it's more the the the, the one that Sydney is fighting is Vadic's right hand. Yes, changeling. I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah. here and uh, and in the end, Jack is able to control Sydney's fighting. Yeah, um, in order to get the better of him, and she realizes. She could sense him doing that mm-hmm. um, and looks at him with a little bit of trepidation Absolutely. here. Um, but ultimately, there's not enough time to really explore this mm-hmm. as they have to run away uh, as Vadic, uh, who has also escaped with the systems um, coming down, mm-hmm. uh, is the and uh, the whole purpose of them being there is to get um, Jack Crusher here because we have that other... Because earlier we do have that moment where she has cut off her hand again mm-hmm. and is speaking to um, this globulous form mm-hmm. um, where, you know, they make it really, really clear the priority, you must get Jack Crusher. They need Jack Crusher. Yes. So that importance of him is absolutely uh, on display, and now that we know the telepathy element, mm. that this is where um, it could be important. If the surmising by Geordie, Picard, and Beverly about the, why they stole the the corpse mm-hmm. of, of Picard from Daystrom, it might be to control um, the doppelganger uh, more thoroughly. Something like that, maybe. maybe. Um, yeah, does this explain the voices that he was hearing earlier on in the season? Was he actually reading the minds of uh, of Valak and of Beverly Crusher? Yeah, it could when be, we heard Beverly it? Crusher yeah. going, "Come back to me," uh, which I want to touch on in a second uh, as well. But uh, half, yeah, you're right. This scene is really, really good. I have to give such props to whoever did the choreography for that scene. It must yeah. be so difficult to get yeah. two actors to move in exactly the same exactly. time. Exactly, it's like synchronized uh, diving or yeah. something like that yeah. in a sense. So it must really, be, good. must have taken a, a, such a long time. But I, but it, I know it's a quick scene, but it works really, really well to see um, him being in full control of somebody else's body. It must yeah. be very, very freaky, but looks fantastic on screen. Great job. Yeah. Yeah. So re- really good. That's more my uh, medium moment. Yeah. More intrigue on Jack now. We're seven episodes into the show. I do like that the episode ends with Vada going, it's time for you to learn your true nature now. Well, exactly. Um, so we will 
hopefully see in episode eight what that's going to be. I hope so. Because one of the things that was missing in this episode, last episode ended with uh, the revelation that Riker and Troy were uh, were taken by Vadak. And in this episode, weirdly, it was just a a kind of a note saying we didn't break uh, Troy or Riker uh, when she's having that conversation with the entity, the face or the voice. Um but we didn't see them in this episode at no. all. I really expected with that cliffhanger ending, we'd see them in absolutely. this episode. But I'm sure we'll see more of them uh, for the rest of the season because they can't leave it there, really. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Derek, uh, what's your medium moment here? Mine's kind of connected with uh, that closing out of the episode because this episode begins with the investigation as to what could have happened to Riker. Um, we see that Seven has reached out to her former... Um, compatriots on aboard the voyager uh where we have uh tuvok here yeah on screen. Uh, great, great yeah. yeah really great seeing tuvok yeah. Yeah. yeah really cool um seeing him on screen um i like that they really play with us uh here we saw in the last episode that all of those easter eggs of all the ships or uh, the episode before all the ships that we saw and we had the theme of voyager playing when yeah uh, when seven is telling her story about the family that she made there so she's reached out to one of her closest members of that crew which was tuvok yeah um trying to find out does he know anything at all about where Riker could have been but i really like just the setting of this because it looks like seven is sitting in the command in the captain's chair and there's nobody else aboard but everybody is off to the side away from the view screen so uh investigating the voice of tuvok to make sure it matches the real tuvok's uh file voice effectively and it becomes inconclusive. So yeah. uh, so Seven has to interrogate even more and, and tries to make this connection with them through their history together playing Kalto, that the game that they played multiple times before. And, she, and Tuvok passes that, this version of Tuvok at least, passes that test by saying, oh, you beat me many times uh, during that game. Um, but only when she mentions the place that they, uh, that they would go to meet up uh, does it turn out that this isn't the actual Tuvac. Um, she does another the other test on him effectively. So she realizes that this isn't Tuvac. This is a changeling who's taken him over. But interestingly here, we've mentioned a few times changelings can take the form of anybody, but she finds out that Tuvac has actually been interrogated to find out that information about their relationship. So he's clearly in a very bad way. He's clearly yeah. been kidnapped by the changeling so they can make an even more realistic version of him, not just impersonate his face. They're also trying to get all of the information that they can out of it, which is really interesting. Um, they're really worried about what could be happening to Riker as well. Yeah. And this Tuvok changes into Riker. I love that scene. Riker looks really, um, really deathly in this. Yeah, he does, doesn't version. he? It does um, almost look like yeah. a death mask of, yeah. of some description, really pale, kind of um, trauma, mm -hmm. sort of bleed lines under the surface of the skin almost. Yeah. Uh, really, yeah, really good. So we, we do kind of see Will Riker in this episode, but not the real. We just see this version of Will Riker, and we kind of hear from the changeling that the reason why he looks like this, that, that, that everybody will suffer under the changelings they will be putting them all under this type of uh this type of trauma and yeah. they'll all wish for death before it's over is uh is the, the phrase that he uses i uh, just want to touch on one other thing that he says when when seven is asking where admiral janeway is uh the explanation that's given from this changeling from uh tuvok changeling is that she's much more concerned about uh about setting up this uh frontier day celebration she's got so much responsibility there so uh, she's off the table at the moment she's really um taken up with all of her responsibilities there but I did have to question that because this is a changeling. So is he saying Admiral Janeway is taken up with that? Does he know? Or has she gone to ground? Is she missing? Are they trying to find her? Because surely she would be a, a very good uh, changeling um, replacement, right, Admiral Janeway, yeah. since she's uh, head of the whole of the Frontier cel Day celebrations. It is the interesting part here, I think. You know, has Admiral Janeway been compromised mm -hmm. uh, and is actually a changeling? And that's why she's not returning any of these mm -hmm. uh, reach outs that, that Seven of Nine has done. Yeah. Or, you know, I, I kind of in the back of my mind, I feel with um, Janeway, in a sense, she, she might know. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's because of possibly some interaction with Ro Laren mm. and, and taking that seriously, whether she's, got, as you say, gone to ground. So, yeah, yeah I, and to me, that kind of feels 
Janeway. It does uh, to me, but yeah. I, I just you just don't know with this situation. Exactly. So I, yeah, it, it's a really good kind of conundrum that's that's brought in. You know yeah. what has happened to Admiral Janeway? Yeah, like the um, other concern is that maybe she has been. Uh, captured, but exactly. they haven't broken her yet to make the changeling that they need to um, to ensure that she passes all these kinds of tests yeah. effectively. Because everybody knows Admiral Janeway, everybody has a very close relationship with her. You probably very quickly realize that a changeling's there. They thought they could cover up uh, for Tuvac because they've um, it's seemingly tortured him to get information out of him. So yeah. uh, maybe Janeway hasn't broken yet. Yeah, which would also be very which Janeway. Also be very very Janeway. Yeah, exactly. And yes. um, I, I think the final thing on this is. It's almost a bit like with Brent Spiner. I loved how Tim Ross just changed there as Seven of Nine, you know, calls out that he's a changeling. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, just goes, you know, in a sense, evil. Um, So I I really like that. Uh, I just think it's so good when you see uh, actors sort of taking on those multiple personalities and characters of different forms it's almost a bit like with uh moon knight uh, mm-hmm. and and the the difference between moon knight mott specter steven and so on all, yeah, yeah. all these different uh behaviors mm-hmm. and characters and how they portray that so i really enjoyed that yeah. element of where tuvok switches yeah um it was really good it must be so much fun for actors to come back yeah. to their roles and told Definitely. you have to play it like you used to play it but you could also get to play a, a different version of that character as well yeah. yeah no absolutely i think that's it for my uh omega directive my medium point shall we go on to our prime directive yes our major point we must face the ramifications of the prime directive so, John, what's your big moment from the episode? My main point is, you know, Starfleet were not the saints that we thought they were uh, mm. from the Dominion War. I really liked this. I loved this interplay between Vadic, Picard, and Beverly Crusher mm-hmm. here uh, when she's captured uh, between the force fields because, you know, we, we get to hear that um maybe the history of Starfleet of the Federation of what they did during that period um is the the history of the victors in a sense it's not the reality it's mm. not the truth which Picard and Beverly thought it was which is that yes they employed this virus to um attack the changelings which is pretty brutal um, in itself but they yeah. it, the 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 known history for the Federation is that they also provided the antidote. Mm. Whereas Vadic is quite clear here that the antidote was never given freely, never given willingly by Starfleet to the changelings during mm. the war, that it had to be stolen for them to to use it. And, you know, it links really nicely, I think, to um, a, a number of different moral conundrums or discussions or ethical considerations that are, that are being had here mm-hmm. by Beverly and Picard, you know, earlier in the episode yeah. where Beverly is also still thinking about some kind of biological solution to these evolved changelings. How to find them. And, yeah. and how to find them. Mm-hmm. And that, but targeting a species uh, based solely on biology is tantamount to genocide. Mm. And this ultimately comes back in this moment with Vadic, where she's really saying that Starfleet had a genocidal uh, program against them because mm. they didn't give the antidote, as is taught in the Federation uh, yeah. from their history. So I loved this, and I, I loved how that makes Vadic's position. You know, when you think of that, you go... There's, there's an understanding of why she is how she is, which is as Picard's, you know, has been hugely radicalized by, by this. Yes. But not only that, the changelings were taken by Starfleet and tested on, effectively tortured, mm-hmm. um, through the experiments to develop this super spy that is able to take that form, mm-hmm. can pass all the tests and protocols that have been put in place since then yes. uh, to form this super spy. Mm. Uh, and so, um, you know, again, it's 
it, it's just the, you know the, it's the questioning of the previous understanding of the Dominion War mm. and Starfleet and the Federation's role in that. Yeah. Um, but it, even with Picard's discussions, where he sees possibly that you know, do they have to ultimately kill Vadic here because she is so far down the road of hatred, mm-hmm. vengeance, uh, reprisals, effectively, yeah. um, that she cannot be, um, she cannot be changed. And you hear again that, you know, she is going to destroy the Federation. You will be looking for mercy. You know, death will come as a release mm. when we have, um, implemented what we intend to do Mm -hmm. and you have this discussion between picard and beverly but you know she's still our prisoner yes and you know are are we undermining everything that we have stood for Mm. previously and it's that real crossroads situation here and i loved how this all sort of played out here um as beverly and, and picard are you know questioning interrogating vadic here and you get vadic's motives and her retort to what they think is you know being the good guys effectively and it and it seems like starfleet maybe you know is not that squeaky clean angelic organization uh, or, or wing of federation of the federation mm. you know i'm if you're i guess i'm vadic, mixing them up here because <laughs> there is the federation yeah and Starfleet is effectively their military and exploratory side. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I wasn't 100% sure whether what Vadic was saying was that they never provided the um, antidote to the entirety of changelings or whether her experience as she had been captured and tested on at Daystrom was that they didn't get the cure that they were being tested on by Section 31 and then stole it so that they, that, that group of changelings um, got the, uh, the the cure. So I wasn't 100% sure about that, but um, but it is uh, it does throw a lot of um, concern on what um, Starfleet would, would have done and what they did. Absolutely. I took it that the experiments on Daystrom were separate to this whole yeah. thing yeah. Um, because it was really, they were e- experimenting around their physiology uh, and their ability to be fluid and to change. Yeah, exactly. And, and it is really concerning that they even would try to do that and yeah. turn them into spies for um, so th- this organization. Absolutely. Yeah. So this was a real meaty sort of aspect of mm-hmm. this episode, which I really, really enjoyed. And I think Amanda Plummer just pulled it off with a plum. Mm-hmm. With a plum, very yeah. good, very good. <laughs> she is great in this. She's, she is she's, really she's good. A, a true kind of vindictive side or or vengeful side to her. Yeah. Um. Really, for for what they've done to her and her and her other group. Um. She even says at one point that um, I watched all of my family die, and now you'll watch yours die. Yeah. Um, ab- absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, that experience you, you can see. Her point of view. Mm-hmm. Again, is that the truth? We don't know. I'm, and I'm hoping yeah. that they really explore this because we have that moment earlier on where Shaw also, when Picard quite, in, in a sense, almost flippantly says, but we provided the antidote. Mm-hmm. Um, but Shaw, you know, does also make the point. Yeah, but not before radicalizing a whole range of changelings exactly. here yeah. to, uh, a- another cause effectively. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, this is uh, this really sort of tickles the foundations of Starfleet and the mm-hmm. Federation here. Yeah, yeah, going to be an interesting Founders Day celebration. Uh, celebrating <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Starfleet and the Federation. Um, <laughs> if there's a entire race like this wanting to wipe them all out, right? Absolutely, but and it really links in with you know how history is portrayed from the victor's side, mm-hmm. and that you know things that were fairly brutal especially during wartime whatever the situation are maybe kind of you know pushed to the side and it's more the triumphant glorious or you know the um those ethical or moral reasons why war was originally um undertaken as to why and this feeds into you know i guess history in general so like i think this is really good because you know i get it uh, the ideals of the Federation mm. of Starfleet are absolutely great, and I love them. But that's not to say that it would always 
be like that because I know, you know, a lot of the things around Section 31 mm-hmm. or even Discovery have come under a bit of a microscope for kind of maybe portraying Starfleet in not necessarily a glorious light. So- well, absolutely. Now, I know there are a whole rake of Star Trek fans who hate the idea of Section 31, even yeah. that, that idea that there's a shadowy organization behind Starfleet because Starfleet was created this exploration group, this uh, this caravan train going throughout the stars. They were created to be aspirational, to, to yeah. be a group of people, humans all working together with alien species. It's supposed to be aspirational for everybody. I know the tendency for uh, this particular group of writers going back to the going back to the late nineties. This particular group of writers is putting in antagonists and putting in people that tear down the ideals of Star Trek and Starfleet. So I know there's a huge group of fans that hope they don't go very hard uh, on this idea. Maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this will be a misunderstanding that Vadak didn't realize that, or that the yeah. the cure for the virus was actually given. You know. Even the idea of Starfleet creating a virus in the first place exactly. has always caused problems for yeah. uh, a lot of uh, of Star Trek fans. But hey, that's why we've got a story that's been going on for sixty years, right? There's uh, always going to be changes to uh, to to bring in other audiences. So yeah. uh, it is a really interesting story for me. I'm not one of those Star Trek fans that clings to things having to stay the same all the time. I want to have new stories. I want to have those uh, those interesting concepts that are brought into these stories as well. So uh, Absolutely. And I mean, I wouldn't necessarily go as far as saying tear down the ideals of the Federation or, or Starfleet. I think they are the ideals of it. Mm-hmm. But it, it's recognizing the fact that in all walks of society, there mm-hmm. are competing interests i mean it's even between the species within star trek that Mm -hmm. there are different interests and that's how it was originally portrayed those different types of interests was that's why the romulans were you know because they were warmongers was the federation Mm -hmm. it was about peace and exploration and the prime directive so they've just shifted where these stories are done and yeah. it's looking inward at the Federation and Starfleet yeah. with these different competing interests, which will always be a natural form of doing it. So yeah. I, I kind of really enjoyed this yes. um, for sure. Yeah, me too. Great story uh, coming out of this. Good stuff. Um, that's your big moment for the episode? It certainly is. It is big. Derek, what's yours? Mine might be a little bit smaller, but it does uh, slightly <laughs> resolve the um, one of the things that's been under investigation for the last uh, for the last couple of episodes. What was going on at Daystrom? Why did they steal Picard's body? I think I actually mentioned last episode that my suspicion was that they couldn't just create Picard and try and replace him. That there had to be some reason to why they needed Picard. So, uh, so we find out here that they are trying, or at least the speculation is that they are trying to replace Picard because. They, they had prepared for this almost. Picard was supposed to have a, a big involvement in the ceremony itself, and they'd already created um, some blockers to ensure that it is definitely Picard because he has to be genetically exactly the same as Picard. So even though they can replicate him, they can look more human, they, uh, they don't have the DNA inside them, which we heard earlier on this season. So it seems like they're trying to use the body to create a replacement Picard and look exact, exactly the same as him. Um, the speculation that the reason why they need the body of Picard and Jack is because the two merge together would give an even closer replica of Picard. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. And the other piece that comes out as well is returning to aromatic syndrome. Now, if you didn't watch the first season of Star Trek Picard, it actually quite heavily deal with this aromatic syndrome, the syndrome that came out back in the original days of, of uh, The Next Generation that would eventually kill Picard. And we saw that in season one. He did eventually die um, due to this uh, aromatic syndrome and yeah. his body has been replaced. So that's why we have this version of uh, Jean-Luc in, uh, in the Picard show. But now they're saying that when the body was under investigation um, by the changelings, that they have discovered that there's an anomalous form inside Picard. Um, Lore explains this, saying that it's a perfectly imperfect version of Picard. Yes. So what I think that means is that they can't replicate Picard because he is not a traditional human because he has this anomalous form inside him. There's no way that they can replicate that. And finding out earlier on in the season from Beverly that Jack has aromatic syndrome means that that's why they need his DNA. So they can't just take a straightforward example of Picard 
and recreate him. They need to combine him with Jack, who has this aromatic syndrome. That's my guess. Yeah, I mean, it's all a bit of a surmise, really, mm. in the same way that Picard, Georgie, and Beverly did yeah. as well. Uh, we get a bit more clarity from from data, but it's almost law just takes over before yes. you can get the a, a real full explanation mm. for it. Because what else would the anomalous form inside Picard be? Um, is there somebody else driving Picard inside? <laughs> is there a tiny little micro uh, cosm inside that's been controlling Well, Picard? yeah. <laughs> I have no idea uh, what else it could mean. But that's that's the only thing that makes sense of what Lore was saying about the perfectly imperfect Picard. It's like he's different to all other species because yeah. he has uh, this anom- anomaly inside him that can't be replicated by the changelings. So yeah. that's why they need Jack. I think that's what they're saying there. But it was a really interesting discussion that was going on. I know you talked uh, a lot about it earlier on uh, as well. But that was my big moment from the episode, the big reveal of what's happening there. Excellent stuff. Mm. Um, I think... And I was right as well. So <laughs> I always like to point out that occasionally I do get things right <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast. Excellent stuff. Uh-huh. Uh any points, Easter eggs, or notes that you want to include yeah. uh, before we round up? Yeah, just a note. Um, since I got something right, I might as well mention something I got wrong, or at least came across wrong in a previous episode, uh, thanks to uh, those of you who pointed this out. Uh, I was talking about the uh, changelings from Deep Space Nine earlier on in the season, and I think it just came across incorrectly what I was saying at it, 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 um The changelings lived on the other side of the wormhole from DS9. And I think for some weird reason, I said they lived in the wormhole. But the, thing, the beings that lived inside the wormhole were the uh, the prophets um, who were worshipped by the Bajorans on this side of the wormhole. Uh, I know that. Yeah. I do know that. Um, and the changelings and the the um, the founders are the are the group um, on the other side of the wormhole. So for some reason, I think I I think I misspoke or I said, said it really quickly while uh, one of you guys was uh, trying to jump in and get another point in. Maybe probably um, so that's probably well, what anyway, happened. Yes. But yes, I, I, I'm aware. Changelings are uh, are from the Gamma Quadrant on the other side of that wormhole, and the prophets are inside. And I believe that is where uh, Captain Cisco is with the prophets, not with the changelings. Of course, why would he be with the changelings? Makes no sense. Excellent stuff. <laughs> so uh, that's my, my correction for this episode. I'm sure I'll have a few more of those uh, as the season goes on. I'm well. sure. And uh, I, I just have two points. Mm-hmm. Um, one is Vadik says to Beverly, do you know about Jack's physiology as well? You know, posing the question. Yes. And um, I love that Vadik follows this up as Beverly retorts, well, he's not meant for you. Mm. Um, and she she again says to Beverly, but he was never meant for you either. And it kind of, the second note links back to, you know, where Vadik is having um, the, I say conversation, but she's being ordered really by the, the, the form or the changeling form. Mm. But it is the question of whether he is a, a changeling or is something else because he does say to her, you know, you must find the boy. Effectively, it's imperative mm-hmm. because he says, or your kind will find your reasons for existence meaningless mm-hmm. as well. You know, it's, it's the use of your kind. Yes. So, I mean, he looks like a changeling here, uh, you know, in terms of how it comes across, but what, that might just be simply because Vadik is using her own hand mm-hmm. and part of her limbs to set up this communication mm-hmm. but it could be just something else um and i'm like so it feels like it's another species yeah, yeah. so it, it, it this is really kind of intriguing mm-hmm. and maybe something more connected with why this jack is so so important yeah you know yeah i, I think more my takeaway from that conversation is much more beverly's clearly a changeling that's what that sounds like that they've replaced beverly and she's the one that's um, been brought here by Jack. So it almost sounded like Vadik was saying to Beverly, he's not yours because we put you alongside him so that you could get on board this ship. Is that, That's what it almost sounded like to me. Um, so remember what I was saying earlier on when you were talking about uh, the new abilities we hear from Jack, that he's able to read minds. He's hearing, he's hearing somebody speak to him. Earlier on in the season, when we heard that, um, we heard Beverly speaking to Jack, saying, come back to me. 
why would Beverly be saying that if he's reading her mind? Why would Beverly aboard the ship be saying that to Jack? That seems weird. But if Beverly is trapped somewhere, the actual Beverly is trapped somewhere, maybe she's calling out to Jack. Similar to what we heard about Tuvok being tortured and Riker being tortured, maybe Beverly has also uh, yep. been kidnapped. Absolutely. And so lots of uh, theories oh, yes. and intrigue here. Um, a lot to be clarified um, as well. So, yeah, good stuff. Three more episodes to go to find out uh, what's going on. Excellent. I think that's it uh, for our points and notes. But then overall, Derek, what did you think of Star Trek Picard Episode 7, Dominion? I like this one. We're we're at the point, as I said, there's only three episodes to go in the season. So we're at that point where we need an episode that is a lot of exposition about what's going on to kind of talk about the motivations of the characters to uh, to set us up on this path for the last couple of episodes. The first time I watched it mm, wasn't as good as the rest of the episodes so far this season. Uh, but the second time I watched it, I think the intrigue that's yeah. uh, that's being laid out um, felt much better to me. So, uh, so yeah, I think, I think it's a really necessary episode. You have to have episodes like this, um, but not the best episode of the season. Um, so some interesting reveals, but you'll have to see next episode to find out what those reveals really mean. So, sure, uh, yeah. so an important episode, but not uh, not the not the best and most exciting episode of the season so far for me. Happy stuff, John. Um, yeah, I mean, similar uh, kind of views as yourself. I mean, I, I think this is a real intrigue episode actually and i kind of really connected in with that much more the second time i watched this episode um i think it was just really kind of good around that certainly uh-huh. as i mentioned around beverly picard and vadic's conversation mm-hmm. but also a bit more with with jack crusher uh, a bit more with vadic's master that we see mm-hmm. whoever that is what it is um, you know, loads of intrigue around that, as well as, you know, seeing Tuvok being a changeling, mm-hmm. the ambiguity around whether he is being held, same with Janeway, same with Will Riker, mm-hmm. possibly with Beverly, you know, as a new theory mm-hmm. that we're, we're throwing out there. So this has huge amounts of, um, intrigue. So I, I kind of give this, um, Four data configurations out of five. Um, and I, I just loved the introduction of chaotic law into this as well. And mm-hmm. just how Brent Spiner can sort of flip between these two characters. And cool. um, same as Tuvok mm-hmm. uh, as well. Uh, it was great to see Tuvok. Really enjoyed that. So, yeah. you know, I'm really hoping they go full in um, on the premise of that final line from Vadic is, you know, that we learn who Jack truly is mm-hmm. um, for in the next episode. So, uh, yeah, I'd give this four data configurations out of five. Excellent. I had a number of things. I didn't. I was did uh, trustless Tuvox or Ooh. split personalities. I just didn't know. Yeah. No, I, I like I like data configurations. That's quite good. Yeah. Yeah, excellent stuff, excellent stuff. I'm I'm really intrigued with the idea that we'll get um, a moment at the end of the series where it's loads of cages with every single member of uh, of Starfleet that we know from Voyager and from uh, and from DS9 and from, <laughs> from uh, Next Generation all uh, trapped at the end of the season. Yeah. That'd be a that'd be a cool visual, wouldn't it? It certainly would. But yeah. I'm not holding out hope that they're going to be they're going to be doing something like that. But yeah. anyway, uh, good stuff. Yeah, looking forward to the next episode then. Excellent stuff. Let us move into our feedback section from our fellow Trekkies. Mm. Uh, first up from Facebook, we have Victor Von Doom, who says, very anxious to see how our heroes get out of this one. Mm. The writers, directors, and producers sure know how to wring out every ounce of emotion from their audience. To quote a saying from The Hood, Vadik gotta go. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely, Victor. D- Vadik does gotta go. Yeah, really um, does. Uh, thanks, Victor. Although I would say I think Vadik, I, I love just getting the additional information and background and the reveal mm-hmm. around her. Um, you know, so whether that injects a bit of sympathy to the character, who knows? But she is singularly determined on the destruction of the human race here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thanks, Victor. 
Joe Herbert says, a weak episode for the season, just too much exposition. Some great character moments, though lacked several main characters that we should have expected in this episode. Now, it's really obvious that Starfleet putting the data hybrid thing in charge of data from security made no sense to me. I don't normally pay much attention to background music, but it was distracting at times in this episode. It was great to see Tuvok, though, but how long did they have to torture him to get so many details of his relationship with Seven that the changeling could know, remember a random one that she asks? I think it would have worked better if he was the one asking or giving info to show he was real, and then she figures out that he's not. Yeah, I can definitely see that, Joe. Um, that If they have been sort of extracting information over a long time mm. uh, with torture, interrogation, uh, by, uh, you know, from a captured Tuvac. Mm-hmm. So uh, really, um, yeah, I, I can see that being equally um as, as, as good here for sure and i i think you're right you know i think f- first watching this i i just wasn't entirely sure about this episode i felt it did drop a bit of momentum and mm. um, i think having watched it a few more times it, i think the exposition it is heavy um i mm. do think it for at least for me i think it's done in a really kind of good way yeah. um i guess it's just um a, a matter of perspective there on that but uh really glad though that you um enjoyed the return of tuvok mm-hmm. even though it was uh brief yes it was it was but good to see tim Russ back uh thanks so much joe yeah thanks joe uh heather wallace says did anyone on the titan bother to try and rescue will while vadic et al were off site i thought that was the point of the plan but instead jean-luc and beverly just let vadic rant on it really annoyed me how Picard cut in as soon as Beverly asked a question and didn't wait for an answer. Mm. That's not how you interrogate someone, Jean-Luc. Also, can pop culture please stop using a nursery rhyme <laughs> song whistled slowly to make it creepy? I feel it reached peak use with my boy Zemo's Bar Bar Black Sheep on Falcon and the Winter Soldier. <laughs> the not too Vark reveal had the biggest emotional punch of the whole episode for me. I was really upset it wasn't him. Mm. I do like that Seven and Shaw have embraced fugitive life by swapping the Starfleet uniforms for leather outfits. <laughs> Back to her traditional outfit. Yes, uh, rebels. Earlier on in the season, uh, earlier on in, in Picard, yeah, good stuff. Um, yeah, on the nursery rhyme, th- rhyme thing, it is becoming a bit of a trope uh, that we see in uh, in lots of pop culture shows. Here, I think it was um, Three Blind Mice at the beginning yes. of the episode, uh, and then we hear Vadik uh, whistling it um, later on in the episode. So, uh, yeah, Three Blind Mice, uh, see how they run. Yeah, so it, yeah, I still quite like it to be honest. Yeah. Um, I think that's just me uh, because I think children's tales generally are creepy. I mean, if you think of Roald Dahl or if you think of the you know the Brothers Grimm mm-hmm. or whatever, they they are pretty they are pretty grim. Um, based in something grim, and creepy, it is yeah. to s- try and scare the bejesus out of uh, of kids into sort yeah. of walking the line i guess okay. so well, three I, blind mice it makes was, sense was cutting off their tails with a carving knife so yeah that's pretty yeah that's pretty creepy in itself right so, <laughs> i guess so uh, yeah thanks so much for your thoughts on this heather i think didn't they um damage the ship so that they couldn't move i didn't think the plan was to actually go and rescue will it was to attract vadic there capture them all and when they're captured, then they would go and search their ship for, for Will. But yes, that's because what they I didn't thought. stay captured long enough, I think, uh, was the challenge because of Lore, um, releasing them all pretty quickly. Yeah. That's, that's kind of how I thought it. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe that there needed to be a bit more explanation, yeah. possibly when Jean Luc has that kind of revelatory moment with Jack where he says, maybe we do have the, the advantage because mm. I didn't quite understand where the advantage actually lay here yeah. because you're, you know, you're inviting Dracula onto, into the home yes. effectively, yeah. which may or may not turn out well, you know, there's still a 50, 50 chance here, that's true. no matter how good the plan might be. I, um, I do think that's actually a benefit to this episode. Personally, I do think the idea that our heroes made a plan to absolutely. trap them and then it flipped and they ended off losing their ship to Vadic by the end of the episode. I think that's, uh, that's an interesting choice. Uh, something that's not done very often, especially with these characters, these uh, self- proclaimed heroes, <laughs> but v- vomit but, spewing. Exactly. Yes, yes. 
So let's see how it plays out for the other three episodes. Thanks so much for all your feedback. Yeah, thanks so much, fellow Trekkies, uh, for the feedback. Really good to get your thoughts. Uh, but I think with that, we are heading over to 10 forward mm. for the pub quiz. Yeah, I think we are. I think we're on to our seventh question for our 10 forward pub quiz. John, do you want to give the seventh question? Yes. Why would a Vulcan never go to Aklian 7, according to 7 of 9? I almost uh, gave out the answer to this question earlier on uh, in the episode. I almost fell into my trap of, <laughs> of I know, uh, writing really a question and then, uh, and then giving the answer in the podcast. So I didn't do it this time, um, but it is in the episode, of course. John, do you want to repeat the question one more time? Yes. Question seven. Why would a Vulcan never go to Aklian seven, according to seven of nine? Lots of sevens in there, um, including, of course, the question seven. Uh, as we say, that is the seventh question of our ten questions. So gather them all together. Email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with all the correct answers for the ten questions. And you could be in with a chance of getting your hands on some Star Trek Picard goodies. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, fellow Trekkies and Trekkers, for joining us. That wraps up. Our seventh episode discussing Star Trek Picard for season three. We, of course, hope you stay subscribed to the podcast. And, of course, if you enjoy what you hear, why not rate us, review us, or indeed share it with your friends, family, and other changelings? Because sharing the podcast is, of course, sharing the love. Sharing the love, yeah. indeed. You can also support us over on patreon.com forward slash TV podcast industries or buy me a coffee.com slash TVPI. But we will be back next week with Star Trek Season 3, Episode 8. You'll be surprised to hear. Mm -hmm. Surrender. Your feedback on Episode 8 is absolutely welcome uh, for our feedback section. And, of course, we will have the next question in our 10 Forward pub quiz so mm -hmm. please make sure you join us absolutely yeah looking forward to uh, to chatting about episode 8 uh, when it comes out uh, we are in an intriguing position at the moment um, where we're going away on holidays on the 19th of April and the last episode of Star Trek Picard comes out on the 20th yes uh, Paramount <laughs> have been very kind to give us uh, previews of the episodes uh, which has allowed us to cover this alongside the other two shows that we're covering but of course, we don't have the finale available to us just yet. So we will try everything we can um, to cover the last episode of Star Trek Picard before we go on holidays. Yes, and in good time. But yeah. there may be a delay for the last episode, yes, which is slightly annoying for us. It's a little bit, a little bit, especially because if we go on holidays, we absolutely are not recording a podcast this time. We uh, we mm. have in the past uh, brought our podcast gear with us, but we won't be able to do that for uh, for Picard. So there may be a delay, but we'll try everything we can to avoid that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so thanks so much for joining us. Hopefully we'll be here for all 10 episodes of Picard and we'll see you again next week. Yes, thank you so much, fellow Trekkies and Trekkers for joining us. It is a pleasure as always, discussing all things Star Trek mm -hmm. with you. In the meantime, however, keep watching, keep listening, and keep trekking. Bye. Bye.